Well, greetings, dear friends. What a joy to be able to connect with you again today as we come and connect, not just as friends, although that we are, we come to connect as brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. We come to connect around His glorious Word so that we can take these wonderful truths, these great ancient wisdoms, and apply them to our daily lives so that we can be transformed into the image of our dear Lord and Savior. Now today, I'm going to start on a slightly different path. You know, as a pastor, I need to be sensitive to the needs of our local congregation. And so I'm going to step away a little bit from the theme of vision and behold the vision. We're going to build on that in a little bit more time. But for today, I want to address a particular area and an area that I think we need to use a lot of wisdom in applying into our lives. Hey, by the way, if you're not a member of our local congregation, but you're a uh, avid follower or you're a friend on our Hillside at Home YouTube group or other social media platforms, if you've got any area that you'd like for me to address or to speak into, feel free, send me an email. I'd love to hear from you. Our email address is Hillside pmb at gmail.com that's hillside pmb at gmail.com love to get some feedback maybe you just want to say hey warren how are you doing uh, and greet us from wherever you are be wonderful to hear from you so today i want to speak into an area that i've been speaking to some of the folks in our church about and i thought to myself yeah you know i need to address this i need to speak into this from a biblical point of view because sometimes we can get a lot of the one side but not too much of the other side and one of the things that I found as a pastor one of the things that are very important in our Christian walk is biblical balance so we often speak uh, of God's blessings in our lives and it's true we have his blessings we often speak of walking in his divine favor or of wielding our authority over those circumstances that come and would pick a fight with us we are very motivated sometimes by those sermons that encourage us to live the abundant life or remind us that we are the head and not the tail or motivate us to keep up that good fight because after all we're in training for reigning marvelous stuff I, I love these messages I, I, I love the fact that we're blessed so much by certain men and women that are gifted in this particular kind of message now you know some people in the Bible are gifted to teach and they will get into the doctrines they'll get into the Hebrew they'll get into the Greek which is marvelous but there are some men and women who are gifted to come and encourage us from God's Word and we need to appreciate their ministries in our lives because it's from the Holy Spirit I'm so blessed that we're motivated and that we're encouraged because these things are based squarely on God's Word and brought to us by anointed men and women so they will come and teach us what it means to walk the blessed and the favored life but here's my question here's my question what happens when we go through those seasons in life when it seems that we are experiencing anything but what these messages are telling us. What happens when we go through those seasons in life when it seems like we're not walking in the divine favor of God? In fact, it seems like everything that possibly can does come against us. It seems like we're facing one obstacle after another obstacle. What happens to God's favor then? What happens to God's blessing then? What happens when we're going through uh, seasons that we feel that we very much are indeed the tail and not the head? What happens when it feels like we're going through such trials and such difficulties that we actually feel that God is displeased with us? Or we feel that we're under God's wrath because of some sin in our life or because of some area that perhaps we've not repented of? What do we make of those teachings in times like that? What about those times when it seems like instead of operating in the boldness of divine authority, we are being plagued with the assaults of low self-esteem? Oh boy, oh boy, I don't know if you know what it's like to walk through those times in life where it seems like your esteem is very, very low. What about those times when instead of running our own race, we fall into the trap of contrasting our own awkward fumblings and our inadequacies with the surging momentum and the charisma of the so-called 
go-getters. Oh boy, have you ever fallen into that trap? What happens when instead of walking in divine health, we're doing all that we can just to cope with the afflictions of health that we may be suffering at that time? What happens when instead of languishing in divine possession, it seems like we're doing all we can just to live on the scraps and on the dregs? What happens when it seems that those that we have trusted in the most have left us or betrayed us? What happens when it seems that our life that was once so iridescent with potential and with promise is now gasping in the puddles of monotonous, monotone predictability? Oh, my brothers and sisters, what happens when it seems like everything has dried up around us? What do we then make of these messages of God's favor? What do we then make of these messages of God's great blessing upon us? Are we any less blessed in those difficult seasons than when we are, when it seems like we've got the wind of the Spirit in our sails and we're cruising ahead? I want to speak a little bit about that this morning. So needless to say that the reasons for the seasons, these difficult seasons that we endure, are many and diverse. So I have no intention to oversimplify matters. Yeah, I have no intention to and nor do I have the ability to. No, what I do wish to offer here is one possible reason for those times that our skies grow overcast and for those times that our paths darken. Like I said, there may be many reasons, but I want to look at one of those reasons yet yeah, today. And, and that reason is that we have a need. I, I know that I'm about to deviate here from so much of the contemporary counsel that we get, so much of the books that we read, the motivational books that we read. But listen, our being deserted by our friends is not necessarily an indication that we need to be more friendly. Uh, our needs run far deeper than that. Our financial difficulties are not an indication that we need to be more generous. No, our need runs far deeper than that. Our esteem issues, our bank balances, our careers and our, uh, uh, our career obstacles, our relational traumas, our trials in their many forms run far deeper than the forms that these trials assume. If we limit the lesson of the trial to the form that it assumes, then we may miss the lesson altogether. And this is it. This is the lesson. The reason why we go through so many difficulties many times is because we need to shrink that's right you heard me properly we need to shrink say the word with me quickly even if there's somebody sitting next to you don't worry about them they know you well enough say the word with me shrink it's not a very nice word is it uh, even the way that it feels when it's forming in your mouth or when it escapes from your lips shrink I don't know, it's not one of my favorite words at all. Not a very pleasant word. Uh, I don't think that if you hear the word shrink, you would associate light or joy or contentment with that word shrink. It's not a word that reassures us. It's not a word that is at all as boisterous or as flamboyant as expand or extend or inflate. Uh, it is not nearly as formidable or, or as commanding as the word possess or seize or occupy. No, shrink is not a word that builds or fortifies. It seems to be more a word of erosive or even corrosive application. It, it, it is not a word that energizes or enthuses. It is a word that often triggers an involuntary instinct to recoil, shrink. This is very unfortunate because the word in and of itself is not intrinsically negative. It all depends on how the word is applied. For example, not many of us delights in seeing our bank balances dwindling, right? That's a very negative kind of shrink. But oh, what joy, what joy of hope there is when the doctor tells us that that tumor 
that once very large tumor is now barely detectable because it has shrunk. That is a very positive form of the word. By the same token, I'm sure that I would not be your most popular friend if I were to speak the blessing of shrinking over your life. Just think of what you would feel like if I came to you one day and I lay my hands on you and I said, may you see great deals of shrinkage and may you experience the joys of reduction in your life. I don't think that you would be too pleased because most of us would apply this blessing of shrinkage to all the good things in our lives. But what if we applied the blessing of shrinking to the depression that has plagued one of our loved, lo loved ones for such a long time? Wouldn't it be wonderful to see that depression shrink and wither? W what if we applied the blessing of shrinkage to that mountain of debt that has smothered you for months? Oh boy, that's very positive shrinking. What if we applied the blessing of shrinking to that waistline? Let's not go there, Warren. Th these are not areas that we would want to see increase in. And yet, we are far more ready to accept the blessing of increase than we are to accept the blessing of shrinking. Now listen to me. The next time someone speaks a word of increase in every area of your life, has somebody ever spoken that over you? I've had somebody speaking it over me before. May you experience increase over every area of your life. And before I had time to think it through, I was like, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, every area of my life, yes, Lord. Whoa, hold on. Before somebody speaks a word of blessing and increase in every area of your life, you need to resist that word. There, there are many areas that you would rather have shrink than you would have increase, right? We understand that the motives of these words and that dear brother or sister that spoke to us, their motives are very good. Uh, they are intended to be a great blessing to you. But the truth is, is that those dear souls who speak those words just don't know you well enough to speak increase in every area over your life. You need to help that well-intentioned brother or that well-intentioned sister a little bit. Say to them, hey neighbor, let's be a little bit more specific about what areas you would like to come in agreement with me uh, for growth. Let's not just say in every area. Let's be a little bit more specific. What areas are you speaking growth in my life? Are you speaking growth in joy? Amen, I accept it. Growth in peace? Amen, I accept it. Growth in my financial status? Yes, amen. But don't just speak a blanket word because you're opening all sorts of very dangerous doors unless you're specific. So let's name those areas. Let's come in agreement about that. But don't ever give somebody carte blanche over every area of your life. That's very dangerous. Some of us need to bind some of the prayers of increase that have been spoken over us in the past because we've allowed increase to happen in the wrong areas. So I think a very wise thing to do is just to, just to, in your next time of prayer, go before the Lord and say, Lord, if I've allowed anybody to speak increase in wrong areas, I just want to bind those areas. I want to shut those doors right now. I want to close those doors right now in the name of Jesus. From now on, Lord, I'm going to be a far better gatekeeper over what doors I allow access in my life. Oh, Lord, let's just bind those right now in the name of Jesus. Once your dear friend has spoken increase over specific areas of your life, those areas that you direct, then invite them to also come in agreement with you to speak decrease in specific areas in your life. Areas that you direct. Once again, be very specific about those areas in which you would like to see reduction. You see, we need to help each other out a little bit in this wonderful uh, call of discipleship. How we grow with one another, how we mentor one another as well. I believe in not just opening some doors, but I believe in the practice of closing some doors as well. Because this practice of opening doors and closing doors, of increase and of decrease, of binding and of loosing, is a very powerful biblical principle. Very powerful 
but often oh boy so often unbalanced because we go for all the opening we go for all the increase we, we go for all the binding or for all the loosing but not for the binding not for the decrease and not for the closing so do you see where I'm coming from this morning when I'm trying to bring a little bit of balance into our biblical practices as well listen to me do you remember in scripture after the Lord liberated the Israelites from their bondage in Egypt almost immediately they were confronted by an impossible obstacle do you remember the Red Sea no problem God said to Moses Moses lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground you remember Exodus 14 verse 16 so they see this they see this obstacle they don't allow the obstacle to stop them they divide it and they open the door God made a way for the people and the people passed through but go on just a little bit further don't stop there go on a little bit further and read what the Bible tells us if you go on and read a little bit further you will see that opening the path wasn't enough opening the path wasn't enough and this is where many of us invite disaster into our lives because we open but we do not close we are so focused on having paths open before us that we neglect to pay attention to those paths that need to be closed if you read further you will see that after Moses and the Israelites crossed the Red Sea they didn't just march on to the promised land that, 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 that would have been disastrous for them because they would have left their rear guard exposed. They would have left an open channel for the Egyptians to follow them right into their promised land. And some of you can't understand why it is that you're so, under such persistent attack. You know that you're not where you used to be. You know that you're not in the land of slavery anymore. You know that you're in your promised land. So why is it? that you're still under such persistent attack. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. You've left a conduit open for your enemy to flow through and to come through your borders and to penetrate your promised land. After the Israelites crossed the Red Sea, God commanded Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea that the water may come back upon the Egyptians and upon their chariots and upon their horsemen. God said to Moses, Moses, close that channel. I'm saying to you, brother, close that channel. I'm saying to you, sister, close that channel. You've left a channel open and that channel needs to be closed. Now, I don't believe that the Egyptians can come into your promised land and dwell there forever. But I do believe that they can form raiding parties and come and cause upset in your life and then disappear. I believe that they can come and rob from your blessing, uh, take from your crops, take from your, your, your lands, take from your harvest and disappear. And, and why? Because the conduit is open. You need to learn how to close that door. Do you see how on the one hand, when there is an opening, you need to have a closing. Where you have a binding, you need to have a loosening. Where you have a blessing, you need to exercise caution where there is increase you also need to have decrease so here's my point here's the application of what I'm saying perhaps you've been saved for many years but for some reason or another you still carry guilt for what you did before you gave your heart to Jesus let, let me just tell you you're not alone there, there are so many people in fact I would go as far as to say that most of the born-again believers suffer from the same affliction of guilt. They may not have had a conscience before, but now that they've given their heart to Jesus, now they have a conscience about what they did. It's not a bad thing. It's a good sign that you have a conscience about those things. But listen to me very carefully. You're now in a different place. You're not in a land of slavery. You're born again. You're a brand new child of Jesus Christ. You've given your heart to the Lord. And, and, and I will tell you right now the reason 
why that guilt has crossed the sea with you, why it's come from the land of slavery into the land of freedom. I, I will tell you why that slave mentality of guilt has followed you. It's because you did not close the channel. I, 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 like I said before, I don't believe that the enemies will come over and live in your land with you. But I believe that there's going to be times where not only do they rob from your harvest, but they will come and rob from your peace. They, they will come and tell you, listen, do you remember what you did when you were unsaved? Do you remember that person that you hurt? Do you remember those harsh words that you spoke to your children? Do, do you remember that time that you stole from that person? Do you remember the harm that you inflicted? Oh, brothers and sisters, the devil is so very good at playing these guilt games. But here's the thing. All those things that he comes and reminds you of, those things that make you feel guilty today, those were all his handiwork. Isn't it amazing? Those are the results of His work in your life and He will come and make you feel guilty because of those very things. Wow, He's become so clever at deceiving us. But you're in a different land now. You're in a promised land. If there is an open channel, then you can close those channels. Stop the enemy from forming those raiding parties and coming into your land. You need to close some of those doors and you need to do it right now. Now how exactly do you close those doors? Well, I believe that that's a deeply personal and a very individual matter. A and you may have to speak to some trusted pastor or spiritual leader. You will certainly have to be spirit-led when it comes to closing those doors. But let me just say on the outset that some of those doors to your past are wide open and they've stayed wide open because you are still associating with the people in the land of slavery. You are still associating with the old crowd that you used to associate with. Well, you thought to yourself, now that I'm born again, maybe I can be a good influence in their life. But you've been associating with them for months and you haven't influenced any of them one bit. In fact, you find that some of your spiritual growth has started growing colder and you've left a door open because your conversation is still the same as it used to be your mindset and your thinking is still the same as it used to be some of the doors of the, your past were open because you still act the same way and when you first gave your heart to Jesus well there was a difference and it could could have been noticed and readily uh, readily noticed but now oh boy those lines between you and your character and your conduct with the character and conduct of the friends of your past are becoming very, very blurred. And so, you've left some of those doors open. You, you, this is what I'm saying. You need to shrink in some of those areas in the old relationships that you had. You need to shrink in some of the areas of the old mindsets that you used to have. You, you need to shrink in some of the areas of the old confessions that you used to make because you're not the same person. Don't speak the same way you used to speak. Now I understand that there are certain areas where you don't have a choice. You've got to hang out with some unsaved work colleagues, some unsaved people and associates. Yes, I understand that. But let me tell you something. There are some areas in your life where you do have control over and if you want to stop that ra those raiding parties from coming into your land and into your promised land, you need to turn around and close those channels off. You need to stand with the staff of the Lord in your hand and make some proclamations. You need to take some stands. You need to have those tough conversations with those friends that you think very dearly of and that you still think very lovingly for because you do, you have a past. But if they love you, then they will respect you when you turn around and say, you know, I, I'm just sorry to say, but the types of conversations we used to enjoy before, I don't enjoy them. Something's changed in my heart. Now, I don't want to lose you, but I would rather invite you to come to where I am because I cannot go back to where you were. That channel is closed. Have you ever realized that in your discipleship practice, everything about your discipleship has to do with your shrinking in certain areas and in your increasing in Christ-likeness. 
But if you look very closely, you will never increase in Christ likeness unless you first shrink in other areas. And that has to do with your choice. That has to do with you saying, Lord, I choose you. I choose to increase in you more than I choose to stay the same size or increase in these other areas. If you don't increase in Christ likeness, then you will increase in the sinful practices that once had you bound. It's inevitable. I've seen it time and again, and brother and sister, I would spare you from that hurt. Listen to what I said again. If you don't increase in Christ likeness, then you will increase in those areas that once had you bound. It's a choice. You have to decide to increase in Christ. The Bible says, No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him. And he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. 1 John 3, 9. Did you see that beautiful promise? It says that God's seed is within you. No, if you're in the promised land, then there are areas that you need to hand over to Jesus. You need to say, Lord, I want to shrink in those areas. Oh God, would you help me shrink in those areas? Because I want to grow with you. If you've been battling in this area in your life, now come on, now that we're together, if you've been battling in any area in your life where you have just feel, Lord, that area is still way too prominent, I have not reduced in that area enough, then I believe that this message, just us speaking today, is a spirit-led, spirit-led affair. Let me come in agreement with you right now as I speak a reduction in your life. This is not you battling alone. Come on, let me stand with you as we come together in agreement for reduction in that area of your life. Right now, come on, let's pray, let's pray. Right now, in the name of Jesus, oh Lord Jesus, for my brother or my sister, I want to speak a reduction in that area that has got them bound. I want to speak. Oh, now we're going to be brave. Come on, stick with me now. I want to speak a reduction in those friendships, Lord God, that are keeping that channel open. Oh, Jesus, I want to speak a reduction in those mindsets. I want to speak a reduction right now in those conversations, those proclamations, those confessions that are still of a land of slavery. Oh God, I come against them in the name of Jesus right now. I want to speak a reduction. I speak the blessing of shrinkage in those areas. Why? Because I want to speak a blessing in the area of increase in good godly friendships, good godly fellowship. I want to speak an increase right now in biblical confession. I, I want to speak an increase right now, Lord God, in biblical men meditations of the mind. Because I do this in the name of Jesus. Lord, did you not give us the power to bind and to loose, to open and to close? And so, Lord, over my dear brother or my dear sister right now, I, I, I stand as it were, over the sea of their crossing and I hold the staff Lord God over that open channel and I command it right now that the wind would blow and come and close that that sea come and close that channel right now in the name of Jesus my Lord and my Savior oh God right now if there be any remnant any raiding party that has come over into their promised land in the name of Jesus, I rebuke them and I cast them out right now in the name of Jesus. And Father God, as I close those channels, I open the channels of joy and peace. I increase in joy and peace and good harvest in their life. And I do that in the precious name of Jesus, my Lord and my Savior. Well, there's so much more to add to what we said. God's put a lot more in my heart, but we will join again next week as we pick up where we left off. Until then, may God bless you. May God keep you. Bye-bye.